Round about the cauldron go, in the poisoned entrails throw. Toad that under cold stone days and nights has thirty-one. Sweltered venom sleeping got, <laughs> boil thou first in a charmed pot. Double, 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 and blind words sting, lizard's leg and owlet's wing, for a charm of powerful trouble, like a hell broth boil and bubble. <laughs> By the pricking of my thumb, <laughs> something wicked this way comes. <laughs> There's a little bit of money that's going to be covered in uh, the other bill, the um, the Build Back Better bill for affordable housing, but only 1 million units. We need 10 million, we need 7 million units all across the country, and our bill will be big enough to top up all the affordable housing that we need. It will finance a complete high-speed rail network all across the country. It has more money in it for broadband. What's in the infrastructure bill is too small. Altogether, we need the big Hershey candy bars in our trick-or-treat bag to cover all of our nation's infrastructure. So just wanted to give you that update. Wonderful. Thank you, Alfeca. Uh, there will be an opportunity at the end of our presentations to ask more in-depth questions. So for those of you who would like to um, test Alfeca's uh, mathematical skills and such, uh, we'll be able to ask her questions at the end. So next, we're going to go on to another one of our speakers. This is uh, Mary Jane Shimsky. She is the majority leader for the Westchester County, New York Board of Legislators. Mary Jane. Thank you so much, Julie. Um, New York, in many ways, is at the heart of the need for this bill. Um, New York, like most of the Northeast and the Midwest, have the oldest infrastructure in the country. And when you're talking about replacing pipes, you're talking about replacing sewers, roads, bridges, just about anything. Uh, the need here is as acute and as extensive as it is anywhere. Uh, we have been making a fair amount of progress in the last month, month and a half. Um, last month at its fall legislative uh, conference, the New York State Association of Counties which represents the 62 counties throughout the state, um, passed a resolution in support of HR 3339. Um, last week, we also had um, an event, combination of media, government officials throughout the state. We had a rousing and very inspirational talk from Congressman Davis, who I understand is going to be on this call as well. Um, actually listening to him talk about the depth of the need on so many levels for this bill and with the passion and the intensity he brought to it really inspired people. Um, in the past week, the Ulster County Board of Legislators has passed a resolution supporting 3339. I know that Albany County is a hotbed of activity on this. And we ha I'm sure we have a number of legislators from Albany County on this call. I see one of them now. Um, we are also working on the state level. Um, the state assembly is circulating a dear colleague letter 
Also, I understand there's a dear colleague letter circulating in the House of Representatives. Um, Congressman Davis may be able to tell us a little bit more about how that's going, but we all know the need. Most of the people on these calls are fairly local officials, municipal, county, or whatnot. Um, we see on the ground, we're the boots on the ground and we see the need and it's starting to filter up. And um, I know we're really getting a lot of momentum in New York State now um, to bring more support to this cause. And um, to that end, Congressman Mondaire Jones, who is my Congressman um, for the 17th uh, New York District, um, signed on as a co-sponsor to uh, 3339. And we are so happy he did. And we look forward to bringing more members of our delegation on board. So thank you very much, uh, Julie. Thank you very much, Al and to everyone else. And um, onward and upward. Wonderful. Thank you, Mary Jane. We were so happy to see Representative Mondaire Jones sign on to the legislation. So that's fantastic. And we'd really love to um, to see if we could get additional Congress people from other people's districts to uh, sign on as co-sponsors. Um, I do want to say that um, although Danny Davis had wanted to be here, we actually have recorded remarks from Danny Davis. So I think we'll go ahead and play those uh, at this time. Uh, Mark, can you run that? I am excited and delighted and certainly pleased to be a part of this effort. HR 3339. The National Infrastructure Bank Act of 2021 would create millions of permanent high paying jobs. It is modeled on previous public banks, which helped build much of our nation's infrastructure. Under Presidents George Washington, James Madison, John Quincy Adams, Abraham Lincoln, and Franklin Roosevelt, those banks helped finance the roads, bridges, canals, schools, hospitals, power systems, and railroads that made our nation the envy of the world. In fact, the last public bank, along with other sound policy initiatives, helped bring us out of the Great Depression and win World War II. The NIB would operate much like previous public banks. It will be capitalized with existing privately held treasury bonds exchanged for preferred stock in the bank. Budget outlays covering a portion of investor stock divided will be fully reimbursed from the bank's earning stream. As such, the bank will be budget neutral, require no new taxes, and create no new federal debt. It will have the authority to lend up to $5 trillion for urgently needed projects across the nation at very low interest rates. It would be complementary to President Biden and Vice President Harris's proposal and the Democratic House Majority Legislative Package to build back better our nation's infrastructure. So I wanna thank my colleagues, Representative Bobby Reich, Representative Jesus Garcia, and Representative Mundare Jones for sponsorship of HR 3339, the National Infrastructure Bank Act of 2021. Additionally, the state and local municipalities, current and former elected officials who are in support of this bill. So I thank you for your effort on behalf of the National Infrastructure Bank Act 
And as I've said many times, we need a $5 trillion investment in our infrastructure. Thinking small has resulted in the infrastructure crisis which are gripping our nation. And I'm very grateful for all of your actions. So we just have to keep up the fight. Sometimes you break off giant needs in ways that are not as giant as the need, but as long as you keep on coming, eventually you will get there. So let's never stop Let's keep fighting, and ultimately, we will indeed win. I thank you very much, and I am indeed pleased to be a part of this effort. All right, that was Danny Davis out of um, Illinois. I believe he's actually from the Chicago area. So we really appreciate him taking the lead and being the champion for this legislation. Uh, with that, I'd like to move right on to um, Another New Yorker, this is Assemblyman Felix Ortiz, who is the former assistant speaker of the New York State Assembly. Thank you, Julia, thank you very much. And thank you to all of you for taking the time tonight to uh, be uh, having this wonderful conversation and continue uh, to ensure that we do not give up. Uh, I just, I would like to say that uh, I feel very proud as, uh, as we have got to this moment where we are today, where finally uh, the congressional delegation in New York has began to have some conversation about this issue. I met with a couple of legislators this afternoon um, here in Albany today, and we was talking about the infrastructure, uh, national infrastructure banking. And one of the things that I would like to continue to uh, reemphasize, and I think uh, Rebecca was right on track because I spoke about housing, and housing is very critical uh, uh, for, for our people, affordable housing, low income housing. And I stress to every single one of them, you know, and I ask the question, can you define for me what is affordable housing and what is low income housing and what is the metric that get used and the methodology to give people of low income and affordable housing, uh, uh, you know, to, to have a house or an apartment. Secondly, uh, I would like to also reemphasize that uh, uh, that this that this legislation that we are all supporting the national infrastructure banking, and I express this to them, has uh, the advantage of not taxing our future generation, and we need to reemphasize that because uh, taxing uh, our future generation is care a lot of people even taxing today. So you know, for uh, with all the respect I have for the congressman and everyone else working in Washington, tireless uh, as, uh, as a respect, I understand that they are concerned about not taxing somebody. But the battle line here is that this national infrastructure do not tax future generation. And we need to reemphasize that. Lastly, I would like to say that I'm very proud to continue to be working with all of you. And, uh, and, and we need to continue to emphasize uh, the importance of the infrastructure that was mentioned before about the sewers uh, here in New York. We are going to have a thunderstorm coming up to, after a couple of hours from now. Uh, you know, I think I say I mentioned this before. My house in in, in Brooklyn got flooded, uh, and it's in the in a, in a little a slope area. So even though it was a slope, we all got flooded because uh, the infrastructure, the sewer infrastructure, is so unthick. Uh, that uh, that cannot support the amount of water that is coming through. So, you know, if our Congress people in New York cannot hear that message and they are trying to be blindsided, I see they're in the, wrong, in, the, in the wrong state and in the wrong Congress. So let's continue the fight. Thank you for uh, having me again and being part of this family. May God bless you and let's keep the fight. Thank you so much for being here, Felix, and for your remarks. It is shocking to think about New York City being flooded. And certainly uh, there were deaths as a result of uh, one of the last hurricanes going through. And so, um, you know, it just reinforces the needs that we have in all areas of the country. Um, so next, let's go to Pennsylvania with Representative Mary Jo Daly. Mary Jo? Thank you, Julie. Um, I'm really excited to be here with all of you tonight uh, as we uh, look towards a Halloween holiday uh, on Sunday. Um, but 
mostly because of seeing so many different uh, new faces um, talking about the National Infrastructure Bank. Uh, there's a group of us working really hard in the Pennsylvania legislature uh, to get our resolution passed. Um, we talk about this frequently and uh, we also have a lot of local government folks uh, from the boroughs and the townships and the counties who have been supportive of this. And it's been really wonderful to get regular emails from the NIB coalition uh, about meetings that we're having with our members of Congress. So uh, I have high hopes because, and I, you know, it's pretty clear that the infrastructure bill that's going through Congress is not going to be able to take care of all the issues uh, that we have. And I think that the National Infrastructure Bank, one of my township officials says, you know, we always need another arrow in the quiver. And so I thought that was a uh, kind of a unique way of saying, uh, let's do this because we really do need um, a variety of ways to um, approach all of these issues. I know in Pennsylvania, we still have um, bridges that are failing. We have roads with potholes. Uh, we are one of those states with a freeze thaw issue that really affects our roads. Um, we also suffered huge uh, damage through Hurricane Ida uh, and a tornado that also went through my area uh, at this, around the same time as Ida. So we're seeing climate uh, changes that are really affecting um, us in a way that we have not been affected before with telephone poles coming down, closing over highways. I mean, it, it was really, it's been a really rough year uh, here in Pennsylvania. So I'm excited to be working with so many people from across the country, uh, all working towards the same uh, initiative. And uh, I'm really looking forward to having some of our members of Congress sign on uh, as sponsors. It was really also great to hear from Representative Danny Davis uh, because we've heard his name, so it was really good to see his yeah, face yeah. and hear what he had to say. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much, Mary Jo, for being here. We appreciate it. Uh, next, we want to move to the other side of the country, uh, New Mexico, we, where we have some really exciting things going on. And we have Senator Bill Tallman of Albuquerque here to give us an update on New Mexico. Thank you, Julie, for giving me this opportunity. Really appreciate it. Uh, I've been asked to uh, list uh, some of the things that I've uh, done to impl help implement the uh, NIB. So uh, earlier this year, I sponsored a resolution in the state Senate urging the Congress to enact the 3339. And um, a couple of months ago, I authored a uh, op-ed piece in support of the NIB that appeared in New Mexico's largest uh, newspaper. And then just several weeks ago, I uh, was the uh, coordinator of a, another op-ed in the state's largest newspaper that was signed by 20 uh, different legislatures and legislators and, and, and organizations. Um, I've participated in about 10 to 12 Zoom meetings uh, regarding NIB. And uh, about a month ago, I was at a regional meeting of the Council of State Governments in, uh, the, in the Colorado Springs, and I spoke briefly about the NIB. And in um, early December, the, the, national, the Council of State Governments is having their national convention in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And um, we're in the process of trying to get us a, a speaker uh, for a speaker promoting the NIB at that national conference. And um, also, we're working. We had a um, several of us had a meeting with uh, U.S. Senator Lujan with his legislative director. That went very well, and we're encouraged that we that the senator may very well sign on. We're also um, I sent a a, a, a mem a email to his, his scheduler several days ago. Uh, asking that we get a personal um, e uh, personal uh, Zoom meeting with the, with the senator. And, in, and finally today, I was served on a panel of a national convention that was held here in Albuquerque, the, the National Convention of the Hispanic Ranchers and Farmers Association. 
and um, obviously talked about the wonderful merits and advantages of, of the NIB. So just briefly, I'd like to uh, share with our New York State colleagues. I grew up in the upstate New York and uh, early when I'm in my early uh, my early 30s, I was the uh, deputy city manager of uh, what of Schenectady County, but that was uh, about 50 years ago. So, because I'm now I'm in my early 80s, so I've been to China a couple of times in the last 25 years. Their infrastructure will blow you away. The the futuristic airports, the high speed trains, thousands of miles of high speed trains. We don't have one mile, and the bridges are all of terrific pieces of are actually are. Uh, works of art. They, China spends 8% of their uh, GNP on, um, on infrastructure. Actually, we spend 2% and Europe spends 5%. And just real quickly, the needs here, I know the needs in uh, New York State are terrific, but they're terrific. We have big needs out here in the West. Um, electric grid in New Mexico ranks number two in the amount of sunshine, and we're in the top five in wind. We have a lot of potential to produce uh, um, uh, renewable energy. And so in the bill, that's the 1.1 bill, bill that's going through Congress, there is zero dollars for New Mexico for electric grid. And we're rapidly approaching the point where we won't be able to, to uh, transmit any more of our, uh, uh, of our uh, wind and solar to, uh, to other surrounding states. Hey, thank you so much, Senator Tallman. We're going to uh, okay. We've got a bunch of other speakers, but I do want to really thank you for your points about China. The only thing I would say is calling them futuristic, it's here today, right? But it's just not in our country. And well, that's compared, the opportunity. Go yeah, ahead. Compared to the United States, they look yeah. futuristic. Yeah, but I mean, this, that's the shame, right? That the future is here in other countries. It's just not here in, in the good old US of A. Anyway, let's move on to our next speaker. He's got um, uh, another appointment. This would be um, Dr. Stephen Hubbard out of Southern California. He is a water expert and um, he actually wrote his PhD on infrastructure uh, financing. Uh, Dr. Hubbard. Thank you, Julie. Um, yes, here in Southern California, I guess as, we, as I look at the uh, bill, um, several things strike me is that first of all, a third of the country's GDP comes from Western states that are all affected by runoff and basically, there's no water, there's basically no life and no economic um, opportunity um, or production. And so it's basically um, absolutely necessary for the country to continue onwards. But yet in, in terms of climate change funding, we're at about um, a, a, a fifth to a 10th of what's actually needed to, re, to actually decarbonize the entire US economy will require around 4.5 trillion. So the 550 billion is uh, the decimal point on that. And then rebuilding the electric grid completely is uh, another 5 trillion to make it resilient and 100% um, or to, so it can support um, uh, clean energy and um, electrical vehicles. And so the need is just as great. The drought continues to deepen and that we got some rain uh, the basically La Nina is going to um, intensify next year. And so it'll actually get worse for at least another year. And so I'm simply struck by the, the uh, gulf between what we actually need as a nation to move forward and compete and what is actually coming out of Congress right now. And this is why the, the need for the bank is so critical. And so everything that the listeners can do to support its creation is basically our futures are depending on it. And as just was observed, the future is always coming, but it arrives at different speeds. And right now we seem to be uh, in, in going into reverse. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Dr. Hubbard. We appreciate your remarks. Um, and next, we're going to go right on to our next speaker, who is uh, Representative Susan Johnson from Windham, Connecticut. Representative Johnson, welcome. Well, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Julie, for um, uh, doing this. And, and uh, thank everybody for the great work that has been going on to help create a national infrastructure bank. 
this is a one way I was just as I'm listening to everyone I'm thinking of this is a one way to unite the country in a way where we can uh, all agree uh, that we need to do something about our infrastructure and here in Connecticut uh, we don't have tolls we don't have a good way of funding our infrastructure and it's been uh, deteriorating for quite some time now since at least the 1980s and we haven't been able to come up with the resources uh, since we had a big accident here uh, to uh, really do the kinds of things that we need to do. I remember several years ago, they, they had this idea that we'd have this megalopolis out this way where we'd go from Boston to Washington and we'd have high-speed rail and we'd have all these things. In fact, high-speed rail was developed here in this country and has been put to use in the, all over the world, but here, uh, which is quite amazing if you stop to think of it. Uh, so um, I've been working on trying to do a uh, public bank here in Connecticut with the municipalities, but this would be a great way for us to unite. It would be a great way for us to connect uh, all our different states uh, with the kinds of infrastructure that we need, whether it's uh, the internet that has to be more secure or um, the uh, transportation systems that should really be, we'd be able to use uh, and um, use it in a more efficient way. Uh, so I find this to be quite exciting and I love the ideas that have been presented by the other legislators and people in different parts of the country to try and do a resolution. We didn't go into session until February, but to work with the uh, banking committee to come up with a resolution uh, to have uh, people in our caucus, our progressive caucus to uh, work to try and make sure that this is something that we'll support and we'll contact our Congress uh, people here in this state to try and get them to sign on to this legislation. Uh, are all great ideas and something that I think will be a real positive plus for our country. And to be able to utilize the money that's in the Build Back Better uh, proposals uh, through the perhaps through the infrastructure bank. Uh, so having this system in place would really be a, a great way for us to try and unite our country. So thank you so much uh, for giving me the chance to speak and uh, including me in this uh, all right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Representative Johnson. I do want to say that it's a question that comes up fairly often when we're doing presentations around the country is uh, how would a national infrastructure bank work with a, a state public bank? And what we reiterate to people is that we would view that as a cooperative relationship where we can work together to accomplish the uh, and meet the needs of the communities that are affected. And I think uh, one of our previous speakers had mentioned that uh, this um, uh, route of financing would be another quiver in the arrow. So essentially, it's really just another tool that struggling municipalities or cities, states would be able to use when they're assessing their infrastructure needs and are looking for financing. And if, and if you can't get a grant to pay for it, then you may you know, need to look out for some creative way to uh, get the funding to uh, address that problem. Okay, um, so let's move on. We're gonna go back to New York um, with Merton Simpson, who is an Albany, New York County legislator. Merton? Yes. Oh, uh, yes, hi, I'm, I'm here in uh, Maryland. Uh, my 93-year-old uh, father had his birthday uh, Sunday, October 17th, and he died October 19th. So I'm here oh, celebrating okay. his life. But I happened to uh, share uh, one of our earlier uh, presentations with my uncle who's a recently retired Harlem physician and he pointed out to me that we need to do more emphasis on pointing out the benefits of 3339 rather than restating the problems that it addresses. So I'd like to just list a, a, a quick uh, sample of the improvements that 3339 will address. Among the deliverables would be less traffic congestion and uh, CO2 pollutions, lead-free water, new schools, affordable housing, mass uh, transit with an e emphasis on high-speed rail, electricity grid enhancement, enough funding for every state. HR 3339 will also revitalize work in America by creating 25 million new jobs with prevailing wages, uh, a buy uh, America prioritization, project labor agreements, retirees from 20 million now uh, underemployed uh, workers, uh, rehires uh, from among uh, 20 million now uh, underemployed workers uh, will provide training in permanent uh, new occupations and will also stimulate union membership. 
And I think one of the problems that we're having with the national effort for an infrastructure uh, uh, enhancement is that uh, there's too much emphasis on the price and not enough emphasis on what would be actually delivered <clears throat> in terms of the overwhelming need. So I think we need to really be about explaining to people the things that will affect their daily lives that are pressing needs uh, and, and, and continue the effort to shore up the failing effort on the national level from the initial proposals to what who knows where the musical chairs will stop. So I, I'm encouraged by the momentum that we have. We have a lot of work to do, but I think with the growing uh, expansion that we're having, we're gonna be able to succeed. So I salute us all and, and can you continue to work? Great, Th thank you so much. And I, I do agree with you, people want solutions, right? Nobody wants to sit on a Zoom call for an hour and a half listening to problems, unless we've got some solutions and some ways to address that. So. Uh, really good points, well taken. Uh, okay, we're going to move now to another part of the country. Uh, we are going to go to Gainesville, Florida with Scott Coons, who's the executive director of the North Central Florida Regional Planning Commission. Scott? Thank you, Julie. Good evening, everyone. And thank you for the opportunity to uh, join the call this evening. Here in Florida, we started locally, uh, moved to the regional level, and then the state, and now we're on to the national level. Uh, several months ago, uh, Alachua County Commissioner Mary Alford, who's been on this call several times, uh, is only with us tonight, serves on my board. Uh, my board is made up of elected officials throughout North Central Florida. It's a council of governments. We're engaged in community economic development, uh, transportation planning, emergency management preparedness planning as well. And she brought to me the concept of the National Infrastructure Bank. We made a presentation to our board. Uh, the board unanimously adopted a resolution supporting House Resolution 3339. And then we went to uh, our state association of uh, regional planning councils. There's 10 such organizations that cover our 67 counties. And my colleagues agreed to present a resolution to our governing board made up of city and county commissioners from all over the state when they meet uh, in January to support uh, the legislation for the National Infrastructure Bank. And then most recently, uh, I've had the honor and privilege to serve as the president of the National Association of Development Organization, which is a trade association of councils of governments, planning and development districts from the 50 states. And we presented the concept of the National Infrastructure Bank to our executive committee. Uh, they recommended that we present it to our full board, which we did uh, just two weeks ago. Uh, the board uh, wanted additional information. We're gonna have a national webinar with our entire membership of over 300 such organizations from across the country. And then plan to have our board of directors uh, take a vote to adopt the resolution supporting the National Infrastructure Bank. These organizations also work uh, with metropolitan planning organizations, which are required by the Federal Highway Administration for federal uh, highway, transit, uh, bicycle, and pedestrian planning and facilities. Every five years, we update a long-range transportation plan. Uh, we identify the needs uh, that are projected for the next 20 to 25 years, and historically, every time we go through that process, we are only able to identify available federal fund and state funding for projects that would address 15 to 20% of the identified need. There is a tremendous need for additional resources and funding to fund infrastructure if we're gonna maintain a strong economy, maintain a quality of life for our citizens. I'm glad that the Senator from New Mexico mentioned the fact that we spend about two to two and a half percent of our uh, gross domestic product on infrastructure. 50 years ago, we spent four or 5%. China is spending 8%. Uh, Europe is now spending 5%. The United States of America, unfortunately, is being left behind when it comes to infrastructure. Uh, we built the world's greatest infrastructure in the 19th and 20th century and have very little uh, to uh, maintain that or expand that in the last uh, 25 to 50 years. So we're very excited about the momentum that we're developing with uh, Council of Governments and planning development districts across the country and looking forward to uh, getting additional sponsors uh, on the House legislation, as well as getting introduced in the United States Senate. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Scott. I really appreciate all the great work you're doing. For everyone else on the call, one of the implications of this is that local leaders in your community have probably heard about the National Infrastructure Bank. 
And so gaining this widespread support from organizations like uh, the ones that Scott is involved in are really going to help us in our efforts nationwide to get additional co-sponsors and to get the legislation introduced in the Senate. So thanks again, Scott. So now what I'd like to do is I'm going to um, go to uh, an author that we actually have on the call. And I'd just like to point out, first of all, that you know a lot of people have different destinations in the US on your bucket list. Like you might wanna go to the Grand Canyon or you might wanna to go to New York City or San Francisco. Um, but I wanna say that due to one of the books that this author wrote, it has put uh, for me personally, Houston, Texas on the top of my bucket list to visit. And that is because uh, of the book that Steve Fenberg wrote called Unprecedented Power. And it's really about um, a guy named Jesse Jones that came from Houston, Texas, was a local developer there and helped grow Houston, Texas from uh, just like a little you know, crossroads up into the major metro metropolis it is today. But Jesse Jones was also the chair, a uh, longtime chair of the, um, the Reconstruction Bank. And this is the most recent example of a public bank in our country. And so what I'd like to do is put Steve Venberg on uh, the line. And, ca and can you tell us, will we be able to find another CEO for the National Infrastructure Bank that is up to the caliber of Jesse Jones? Hi, Steve? Julie. Thank, thank you so much for uh, <laughs> including me. I was not expecting to speak. I was going to be a spectator. No, you get to, uh, you That's get a good talk. question. I, I don't know the answer to it, unfortunately. Uh, Jesse Jones is embraced by Republicans, Democrats, liberals, conservatives. And, and I want to uh, go back to something that uh, I think Representative uh, Johnson said about this bank unifying the country. That's something that happened during the Great Depression with the Reconstruction Finance Corporation because they wrapped it in patriotism and they encouraged people to embrace the power of good government. And I think that that's an element that we, that we should address as we promote this National Infrastructure Bank, that it is something that will improve the life of everybody. And I was so impressed with Alfeca's list because as I was looking down the list, I wrote everything down. I thought the Reconstruction Finance Corporation during the Great Depression addressed every one of those issues during its time and did so successfully and made money for the federal government and its taxpayers while doing so. So uh, I'm not promoting my book, but I do have a new website. It just so happens, stephenfenberg.com because I wanted it to be a resource for people to go to to learn more about the Reconstruction Finance Corporation and the role it played in uh, saving the economy during the Great Depression and militarizing industry during in time to fight and win World War II because it's such a model for today as we address the coronavirus, climate change, uh, and our crumbling infrastructure. It's there, we did it before and we could do it again. Thank you so much, Steve. Um, I, his book was great. It's called Unprecedented Power. And uh, so I'd really uh, encourage everyone uh, to take a look at it. Um, Thank you, Julie. You're welcome. Okay, uh, we're going to move on to, uh, we're going to go back to New Mexico, where we have uh, Dennis Montoya on. He's the past state director for uh, LULAC, which is an associ association of Latin American citizens. Uh, Dennis? Thank you, Julie, and good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. I certainly appreciate the opportunity. This morning, uh, Feka Mutardi, Senator Tallman, uh, and many others attended a session of the um, Association of Latino Ranchers and Farmers. And some opening remarks were addressed to us by its uh, organizer, Mr. Rudy Arredondo, and he pulled no punches. He said, in short, I don't think the DC politicians are interested in helping us. To me, that is the crux of why we are proposing the National Infrastructure Bank because the National Infrastructure Bank will move ahead without regards to, or at least diminishing greatly, 
the kind of political football that is currently being played with the country's infrastructure needs. So New Mexico LULAC, which I had the honor of being the state director of for several years. I am the immediate past state director now because we have term limits. We don't, we don't let our leadership stay in, in place forever. Um, but I do have a seat on the board and we have been extremely active in soliciting our congressional delegation uh, to sign on to HR 3339. Uh, Senator Tallman, um, Alfeca, Dr. Hubbard, and other members of the coalition have assisted us in Zoom meetings that so far have been held uh, with the office of our uh, Congressional District 1 representative and our uh, District 3 representative. And we have a pending meeting with um, our Congresswoman from District 2 a Republican, uh, but we reach out to everyone. Our meeting with uh, Teresa Ledger Fernandez, which was within the past five, six days, was especially promising because she attended it in person. She didn't leave it just up to her staffers. Um, and she asked a lot of very intelligent questions, which I think were fielded very well by Alfeca and others. And one of the questions she had was, how would the NIB play with a um, state public bank? State public banking in New Mexico already has the support of Congresswoman Ledger Fernandez. And I think she liked what she heard I may be projecting too much, but uh, I do know that Alfeca answered that question very well. Uh, unfortunately, we did ha not have a representative present in that Zoom meeting, uh, but perhaps we could do some follow-up and we may have another, another sponsor in the offing. Oh. The problems in New Mexico are extremely real and they're human-sized problems. Um, my respect to all of you who come from uh, large urban areas, New Mexico is largely a rural state. Our total population does not exceed 3 million. Parts of our state have not seen anything like economic prosperity since the New Deal. My father worked for the New Deal, worked for the Civilian Conservation Corps in part in his younger days. And down the road from where he worked was the WPA, the Works Projects Administration. These FDR era programs left indelible marks on New Mexico and a very long cultural memory. The reason that I support, the reason I personally support the NIB proposal as it is stated in HR 3339 is that I know of no other proposal that promises a return of some semblance of economic stability to my home state, uh, similar to what we enjoyed under the New Deal. So um, we could go on at length, but I can tell you that for New Mexico LULAC, the selling point is the commitment that this coalition has to representation of ethnic and cultural minorities in the proposed NIB, the commitment that it has to rural development, the fact that we are not going to be a footnote um, in the activities of the NIB, but kind of a focal point. Its commitment to diversity means a great deal to us. And we have endorsed HR 3339 I would like to commend our District 1 Director for New Mexico LULAC, Mr. Richard Roybal, and I hope that we can in the future incorporate him into more of these meetings because he has been a mover and shaker in getting these congressional um, meetings going. And he has uh, put his, his full faith and effort uh, into that and it is producing results. Once again, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you. I look forward to our future collaboration.
Thank, thank you, Dennis. We have a great uh, group of people in New Mexico that have been working really hard to raise awareness of the National Infrastructure Bank and, and its yielding results. So great job to all our New Mexico folks. Now we're going to go to uh, the Pacific Northwest, and we're going to hear from Carolyn Barcliffe, who's the founder of Build Back Better USA. She uh, actually lives in Olympia, which is the state capital of Washington, and she's been very active in gaining support for us in the Seattle area and um, in King County. So Carolyn, can you give us a quick rundown? Sure, so Washington is um, a pretty amazing state. We have everything from two mountain ranges, um, a volcano that exploded, others that are alive now. Um, we have ocean shore, we have agriculture, um, and we have earthquakes, uh, which provide a threat of um, tsunami should, <laughs> should that ever occur. We could use a lot of work on our infrastructure. I looked up today um, a, a report, the um, 2021 report uh, from the infrastructurereportcard.org. I don't know if you're familiar with that, that uh, organization or not, but I looked up Washington and Washington has a C, which is an improvement. Um, and we have a tremendous problem with Puget Sound uh, being polluted by a stormwater runoff. Um, and it, it's, it's something that uh, is going to require a ton of money and we can't always get the money that we need for the projects that we need. Um, I can tell you that I pay $50 extra on each of my cars when I renew my license plate tabs so that the city of Olympia can improve the roads. That's a lot of money to, to people, $50 on your car tabs. Imagine being working two jobs at a minimum wage and uh, not being able to afford that extra $50. It means you're, having, you're losing something else. Um, when we had the heat this summer, we're experiencing a lot of strange weather too. We had um, in, here in Olympia, 110 degrees. It has never, ever been that hot in my entire lifetime and nobody can recall a time when it got even near there. We might get 101, two or three, but not 110. And you couple that with um, uh, the, the forest fires that we have, the wildfires that we have in this state, which are very disastrous, um, leading to landslides and a whole host of other things once the rainy season starts. Um, we had to keep in 110 weather, degree weather, we had to keep our windows closed because of the smoke. And um, we don't have air conditioning unless you live in a new house uh, in Washington state. We, we don't have that kind of um, infrastructure or possibility to pro provide that uh, throughout the state. Um, we have a lot of water issues that are pending because we had uh, many counties that were classified as having drought this year. Um, it, I can tell you it takes me twice as long to drive to the airport now as it took me 10 years ago. It's gotten so bad, but they have light rail. We need the high speed rail. They, we have light rail that starts about 45 minutes north of me. And so a number of times we've taken our car and driven there and then ridden the light rail into Seattle so we don't have to deal with the driving. It's just, there's a lot of things that need to be addressed and uh, uh, Washington uh, taxpayers um, pay quite a, a large amount of money uh, in our state. So um, I would just say to you that uh, when our stormwater drain off um, issue comes up as a a D plus on our report card. Um, I think that says a lot. We have bridges that have collapsed. It's just Thanks. been amazing. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Carolyn, really appreciate that. And, and I do wanna reiterate that we've held multiple uh, meetings with various uh, legislative districts and movers and shakers in the Seattle area. And so appreciate all your help on that. And okay. now um, I'd like to go back to the other side of the country, back to New York, and we have uh, another Carolyn on the line, Carolyn McLaughlin, who's an Albany, New York County legislator. Other Carolyn? Are, are you muted? Yes, yes, I was muted, talking oh, to myself. Right. It really is good to be with you all tonight and 
I'm learning um, as I listen, and I want to continue to um, thank my colleague, Merton Simpson, for his leadership on this issue in our community and keeping us abreast and attuned um, and making us aware of how important this is to us as in, in, in Albany County, um, as well as around the country. Because I, as I stated in a, a few weeks ago, it is so important that, um, you know, here we sit in Albany County and we in particular in the city of Albany, one of the 13 original colonies in this country. And we live in a community that our infrastructure, if you, if there's a sinkhole that happens and it does happen quite often in Albany after a heavy rain, you can look down and see pipes that are made of wood, wood underground that is transporting water in our city. We have just lost the use of a national treasure, our park, Lincoln Park, because we have spent the, be the last, the next two summers will be spent to deal with an infrastructure problem that we have had to deal with in all of my lifetime. So now we've had to lose the park so that they can start making sure that there's not continued flooding in, in this area. Hopefully, but we had to wait for, I don't know, 50 years to get enough money to, to do it. So we should not have to wait that long for the next project. We've got crumbling bridges. We've got, at any given time, like I said, you could, a sinkhole could, you could drive through and find out you can't drive through because after a heavy rain. We've got um, other transportation issues, like I said, bridges, roads, that we just don't have enough money to fix. And if this, to me, this is a one-stop operation where we could tackle these kinds of problems. Now, I do know that, and I, I, stay, I do believe that there's not a city, a county, state, town that would not have a positive impact for this National Infrastructure Bank. And if our leaders individually and collectively um, in this country don't get this message, um, it's up to us to make sure that they get it. And, but that's going to start with us talking to our people in our community. And then now some of us, most of us on here, we're a little more well-versed in this than the average citizen. How do we make sure they understand that this is something that's not just, don't think of it as just a bridge or a street, but think about, I mean, the housing infrastructure. We have got such a list of uh, a, a, a massive list of abandoned housing, housing that will never be restored because there's no money to do it. You cannot, as a citizen, decide, I'm gonna take this building and put it back on the rolls, tax rolls, because you don't have the money to put into it and you will never get back what you do invest into it. So here's another opportunity to impact affordable housing in our communities. Albany is an old city. It has old housing. It has old infrastructure. And, it's, and the telecommunication system that we operate on in certain parts of the city is, is so wanting. I mean, I'm, I'm, I hope that I stay on with you tonight because I live in a part of the city where my, um, this, I feel like I'm on a telecommunications dirt road instead of a superhighway. And here's an opportunity to address that issue as well. And look at our schools. You can't wait to give young people the schools that they need so that they can feel proud to go in and get the education that they need. Libraries are like a home away from home if we have the proper uh, um, libraries in our community. So when we think about infrastructure, this is how I describe it to people. This is what this bill is about. It's not just roads and bridges. It's energy, it's telecommunications, it's housing, it's recreation, it's schools, it's libraries. I want to educate the people. I just voted early voting on seven propositions that were on my ballot that if I didn't take the time to read them and understand them prior to going to vote, I wouldn't know what to do with them. The average citizen does not turn their ballot over. So think about this. The average citizen is not sitting up what is the National Infrastructure Bank? Is there any money in it for me? Yes, it is. It might not come into your pocket, but it comes into your community. It translates into you having a sustainable community to live in. I look forward to the opportunity where Mert and I will have an opportunity to bring our state leaders 
to task, to bring them on and have a conversation about this and tell me why aren't you supporting this bill? Wait, I don't understand, thank it's a no brainer to me. Why aren't you supporting this bill? That's the answer that I'm looking for right now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carol, and I appreciate your passion and we're gonna get you on some more of our phone calls. So uh, uh, love your, your input. And uh, just out of curiosity, how many people live in Albany? I'm oh, sorry, it's about 98,000 according to the last census. Oh, really? In the city wow. of Albany, in the city of Albany, Albany mm -hmm. County, it's in over 325,000 uh, in Albany County. Okay, yeah, cities of all sizes need infrastructure, that's for sure. And sometimes for the smaller cities, it's, it's harder, even harder to get financing. So I really appreciate you uh, talking about the needs there. Okay, so we're going to real quickly go to a, a couple other people on the call and then open it up for questions and answers. So uh, first of all, I would like to call on Ellen Brown, who's with the Public Banking Institute, and perhaps, um, Ellen, you could maybe talk about the relationship a national infrastructure bank would have with uh, a state public bank. Ellen? Okay, thanks, Julie. I, I've really enjoyed these last few speeches. I took some notes. I hope I can, I won't quote yeah. you directly, if, but I, I'm going to refer to these stories because those are the human stories that, of why we want to do it. And I love that argument that our, Washington doesn't care about us <laughs> or, you know, it's not going to get done there. We have to do it ourselves. And this is a way that we can actually capitalize on the money-making powers of banks that they have used against us by forming our own bank that we don't need Washington for, and we really don't need, I don't think we need the Fed for, I'm still working on that, but anyway, so uh, you wanted to know the relationship with public banks. Well, um, that, that I think what most people don't know and what is uh, really important to know is that banks don't lend other people's money. They actually create the money they lend on their books as a deposit and then they balance it on the other side with the liability and that that's how it works. But anyway, so we too can do that. We can issue just write uh, deposits on our books and create loans. This is how the Chinese do it. They, uh, they have a big infrastructure bank and they, uh, they just write loans on that, you know, that as credit on their books deposits on one side and liabilities on the other side and it all balances. And then they have an asset, but they have a liability to the, well, anyway. <laughs> so, so they build the thing with credit basically. And that's what the American colonists did. That's what our founding father, well, that's definitely what the, what the uh, Roosevelt did during the Great Depression. We are in a Great Depression. That's why those stories are so valuable because that's what a depression is to not have your basic local infrastructure like your parks and your all those things anyway that's that's what it is to people <clears throat> so i thought that was great all right um, oh so so you you do need somebody like on the ground to handle your banking things and that would be the public bank but you want it to be public so that it is mandated to be in the service of the public Wonderful. Thank, thank you. Um, and now I would like to uh, go to my home state of Alaska, and we have Representative Harriet Drummond on the phone, on the line, I do believe. And um, we've been doing some work around the National Infrastructure Bank here in Alaska. We have some significant infrastructure needs. Harriet, could you um, um, make some comments on our infrastructure needs here in Alaska? Is oh gosh, um, I'm I'm on now. <laughs> Sorry, I wasn't I wasn't prepared to um, to speak today. Um, other than we've been having a real struggle with our budgeting process um, here in Alaska. Uh, not a lot of support from the um, from the governor and the inability of the um, legislature to commit uh, further funds to infrastructure. Um, as you know. Um, we are the state with the largest geographic spread in the nation with among the smallest populations to operate this huge um, 
beautiful, amazing, and um, needs intensive state. Um, we have, we run a state ferry system that um, if you superimpose Alaska over the lower 48, that state ferry moves people and goods from uh, the way I look at it, from Arizona to Oklahoma to Florida. And when you add the, um, the uh, run to Bellingham, Washington, that puts it out in the Caribbean some, uh, uh, somewhere. And that's about a 3,100 mile um, uh, transportation system that uh, no other state does. We have serious replacement needs for those state ferries that are not getting uh, are not getting accomplished by the current administration, and um, um, of course, there's uh, all the road work that we have to do. We have issues with permafrost. We have um, uh, oh, our state our state operates in the neighborhood of 250 airports, mostly small rural airports for for um, whom those villages and remote communities have only, can only be accessed by air uh, and in some cases by water. Um, they are not connected to the road, to the road system um, for the most part. And so, yeah, we've got serious needs and broadband, broadband is another one, uh, another serious issue as it is in many parts of the lower 48 states. And uh, we're not making enough progress in that, in that respect. And as we all know, the pandemic showed us uh, where our shortcomings um, have been in broadband, uh, not only for uh, telehealth, but for um, education and uh, the, the conduct of, of business um, in general. Um, so that's, that's, that's what I've got, <laughs> that's what I've got to, uh, to contribute thank so thank you thank you well thank you i knew you could write you would rise to the occasion so <laughs> uh, and i do want to point out we've had some people talk about uh new york being a very old state alaska is a very young state we're the 49th state but we have huge infrastructure needs also um and we we deal with a very harsh climate the arctic is um dealing with uh, massive effects of climate change we have entire villages that need to be moved off the coast because of erosion so um so the infrastructure needs are across the country and um apply to old states and new states as well so um next i would like to go to um, a member of our coalition in Oregon, and that would be Jack Hanna. He's a retired attorney and former, um, uh, I believe, chair of the um, Pennsylvania Democrats or acting chair and is now very active with the Democrats in Oregon. Jack, can you make a few comments? Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Julie, and a pleasure to join everyone. <clears throat> I just want to um, add on top of the comments that everyone has made, especially uh, Carolyn McLaughlin, uh, Dennis Montoya, and Merton Simpson, uh, with regard to the needs that our country has concerning our infrastructure and what we can do about it as citizens. After the dust settles from all of the current debate involving the infrastructure bills that's being uh, uh, considered in Washington, D.C. by the House and the Senate, uh, and hopefully passed, uh, we all know absolutely it's not going to be enough, as everyone has just spoken to on the subject, and we need and must do more. Um, and how do we approach accomplishing that task? I suggest to you we need to start thinking outside of the box, and that is just not approaching Congress uh, only uh, as far as promoting the idea of the National Infrastructure Bank. Um, uh, they are exhausted now. They have traditionally approached this in a way that we are witnessing is unsuccessful. And that's why it's up to us to seize the moment and to have a creative breakthrough about how to address the crisis that we have with our infrastructure and the failure of our government to confront the shortfall that is huge and must be addressed. Uh, we need to be creative about the bank uh, because 
uh, everyone, especially locally, uh, appreciates uh, what our infrastructure needs are. So uh, I suggest to you today, we need to reach out to our community members that includes not, uh, includes not only our elected officials from the city, from uh, uh, the state and county and local government, but also our Congress members and Senate uh, uh, and our opinion leaders throughout the community and our, our uh, uh, citizenry that's involved with our, uh, uh, our community at large in order to convince them that we need to press our elected officials in Washington DC to pass this legislation or else it's not going to get done. So uh, I suggest to you that, uh, 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 that the theme of our meeting tonight prompts us to, uh, I suggest consider uh, having a, a patriotic and uh, topical approach to Halloween. And so if you or your kids uh, are still undecided about what kind of Halloween costumes to have, let me suggest to you this. These are the following people uh, throughout our history in the United States who have supported a national infrastructure bank. And perhaps uh, 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 going around in a costume of them might help convince uh, those that are unaware, unaware of a uh, national infrastructure bank and who supported them uh, to come on board and join us with this effort. And first and foremost, it has to be Alexander Hamilton, um, who, by the way, was a very uh, spiffy, fancy dresser and uh, very uh, impressive as far as his attire is concerned. Another, Abraham Lincoln, who was rather uh, the exact opposite, who wore pants that were at least three or four inches too short and other uh, faux pas as far uh, as uh, being a, a dowdy dresser is concerned. Others uh, include uh, Frederick Douglass, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, our president, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, uh, our uh, inspiring leader, uh, uh, Martin Luther King Jr., and also Cesar Chavez. All of these people throughout our past history in our country have supported a national infrastructure bank. All of them we all admire and had the knowledge and the understanding and the perception to see that uh, we will be successful or fail based upon our country's infrastructure. Let us go out and advocate for uh, our bank in order to take our country into the 21st century. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jeff. And with that, we're going to open up for questions and answers. So uh, does anyone have any questions or comments? And I see Dennis with his hand up. I have my hand up, Julie, because I would like to briefly share. And I want to thank Jack Hanna for his excellent comments. I want to briefly share something that underscores the disparity, the brutal disparity in infrastructure that exists uh, in the United States today. This particular item is um, just 100 miles west of Albuquerque. And I promise I will not play the entire thing, but I want to make sure I'm sharing the sound. Easy to miss this corner of the Navajo Nation, 100 miles west of Albuquerque. Most things pass the reservation right by, including progress. Many of the roads here are unpaved. Electricity is spotty. Unemployment in the area hovers near 70%. But perhaps most shocking of all, an estimated 40% of the people who live here don't have access to running water. And the sink, what does the sink do? We don't use the sink because there's no running water. It's just there. Yeah. Loretta Smith and her husband shared this small yes. mobile home with their disabled granddaughter, Brianna. Okay. Seven? All right. With no indoor plumbing, what little water the family has inside is carried in, bucket by bucket, stored in plastic barrels outside. 
Yes, for sure, yeah. That is an excellent video. It's posted on YouTube. Um, I encourage all of you to watch the rest of it. But this type of reality is what hundreds, thousands of New Mexicans live with and hundreds and thousands across the country. We spend trillions on our military. Um, we spend immense amounts on all kinds of things, but yet we have Americans, including first Americans living under these kinds of conditions. Um, this is what the National Infrastructure Bank needs to address. Thank you. Thanks, Dennis, for bringing that up. Uh, we have many uh, people living in those same conditions in Alaska. Uh, no running water. Uh, uh, some people are still using what we call honey buckets for sewer because there is no plumbing. And it is um, shocking for many of us, I think, to even think that people are still living in those kinds of conditions. It just underscores why we need the economic revitalization that a national infrastructure uh, bank could bring to rural communities. Uh, Merton, you've got your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to make a very quick comment. You know, Dennis just uh, hit me on one of my pet peeves. We were able to spend $300 million a day for 20 years in Afghanistan. And to quibble over $3 trillion, you know, infrastructure package is ludicrous. $300 million a day is enough to give a million dollars to every adult in America for 20 20 years. There's no way we can't afford to take care of the devastation created by COVID and, 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 and the need to reclamate our economy from that damage. So I just want to emphasize that point. Okay. Thanks, Burton. Uh, any other uh, comments or questions from anybody on the line? I do want to say that um, the National Infrastructure Bank Coalition has been um, holding multiple, multiple of these Zoom calls across the country, uh, building support for the bank. We've also paid for advertising in a variety of communities. So we've had advertising in Olympia, Washington, the state capital. We've done advertising in New Mexico. Uh, we recently did, I believe it's a digital ad in Toledo, Ohio. So. Uh, and of course, one of the things I'm most proud of is the ad that we placed in Delaware, um, President Biden's home state advocating for a national infrastructure bank. And um, so we're really trying to get the word out there in a variety of mediums. Um, the people on this call talking to your re elected representatives, talking to your, your friends and neighbors about it is um, going to help um, uh, greatly with uh, getting support for the bank. Uh, we're showing here on the screen is one of the op-eds that has been put in. This is uh, Senator Tallman's. Uh, he's been very successful in getting op-eds placed in New Mexico. Uh, we've also had an op-ed here in Washington and, and frankly, around the country, as you can see here. Uh, if anyone on the call would be interested in getting an op-ed placed in your local newspaper, please contact the coalition. We'd be happy to help you with that, provide uh, maybe kind of a, a model op-ed that you could uh, then modify for your particular area. So um, we appreciate um, uh, all the help there on the op-eds. Here's a, an idea of some of the places where we've put paid advertisements out there. And we're not, um, you know, a, a well-to-do um, uh, volunteer organization, so we depend on donations from our supporters. And so certainly if anybody was interested in supporting us and contributing to our advertising, you could go to our website, which perhaps we can put our uh, contact information up. And so everybody would have the opportunity to um, see the contact information. So we'll do our members of our coalition will do Zoom calls for uh, for one person, for three people, for ten, for a hundred, and so um, we welcome your inquiries and would love to um, do an informational call for for you or um, you, you know uh, staffers or your um, state state or local elected representatives. So um, there's a. 
you know, a request from us, call your member of Congress and ask them to co-sponsor HR 3339. And uh, what, what about our contact information? Is that the next slide? There we go. And our contact information, our website, email address, our Facebook page, and a phone number. So um, do we have any other uh, questions or has anybody um, else thought of any uh, comments they would like to make? Uh, Julie, can I make one comment? This is Carolyn. Sure, sure Carolyn. Um, I wanna just say, don't forget your grassroots groups. Um, we've been active, we're out there, we're doing a lot of work. We've been working diligently on the two infrastructure bills um, and we're working on this one as well. Um, and you will find, I believe, a very receptive audience out there, particularly with the shortfall of the federal legislation that's about to happen. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much, Carolyn. And, and I, I do want to uh, chime in with Carolyn is that uh, we get a very, very positive response when we, um, when we approach anybody pretty much with the National Infrastructure Bank. So um, I think that if you contact your, the elected representatives in your area, that you will get a positive response as well once you get their attention. Um, so again, we appreciate your uh, attending the call this evening and everyone's hard work in advancing our cause. So thank you so much, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Happy Halloween. Thank you. Enjoy. Happy Halloween. Thanks, everyone.